my name is Dave Oliar. I'm the Director of Long-Term Monitoring and Community Research at Hawkwatch International. Um, and we'll be talking to you today. Um, I'm joined by Jesse Watson. He's our research biologist. Hi, Jesse. Hi, folks. Happy to be here. Happy to have you here. And we're going we're gonna to talk Hawk ID and, and tips and, and focus in on a couple, uh, a tough group to, to start today. Um, but if you haven't joined or been part of or, or, or viewed a Hawk, Hawkwatch International um, webinar or been to a research site or, or seen anything about us, um, we are um, a nonprofit that's mission is to conserve the environment through education, long-term monitoring, um, scientific research, uh, focused on raptors as, as indicators of ecosystem health. And so we have a lot of projects in the West. We have projects in um, Af Africa, South Africa, and Ethiopia. Um, and most of the work we're done is geared to do is, is focused on birds of prey and how they fit into the different ecosystems that they, they occur in. We're based in Salt Lake City, Utah. You can see the address up there. If you have any comments or questions about uh, today's presentation or anything to do with migration, you can, you can shoot a note to migration at hawkwatch.org and we'll be sure to get back to you as, as quickly as we can. Um, Jesse and I are sharing screen control, so I'm trying to take over his computer. So uh, this is the first of a set of ID um, workshops or webinars that, that we're doing. And today we're gonna focus on the exhibitors and on kites, but we'll start off by talking about um, some ID tips in general and some general rules and rules of thumb and, and, and tricks to use and, and, and approaches that um, will hopefully make you successful in working through your IDs. Uh, this is the first time that we've we've done a, a workshop series like this. A lot of times we'll do all of the raptor species all at once. And so uh, I think the idea is that hopefully with this um, quick lunch break or after lunch break or right before lunch break, depending on what time zone you're in, um, you can you know get a digestible bit of raptor ID knowledge uh, and build on that in future sessions if you're, if you're into that sort of thing. And so that's kind of what we're shooting for here. Um, and we'll go along and if you have questions, you can put them in the chat uh, and they'll get passed along to us and we'll either address them as we're going or we'll, we'll have time for some questions at the end, hopefully, too. So here we go. You able to forward it? There you go. Here we go. All right, so if you have done any hawk watching, before, you're probably familiar with uh, raptor specific guides that can be used to improve your skills. Um, just like any bird group or animal group, there's many different guides that exist. Uh, we're, we're partial to Jerry Ligori's books. Um, they are kind of the hawk watching Bibles and you will, you will often see them at many of the hawk watch sites. Uh, all of our crews have copies of these guides or at our sites that they can use. And really, they're useful because, particularly the two guides in the top left here, are useful because they uh, are, are really tuned into identifying birds or raptors specifically while hawk watching. So beyond a normal guide that's like looking at characteristics of, of say, the plumage and, and really fine detail uh, up close on plates, these have plates of birds flying in typical postures and at distances that you would expect uh, at hawk watch. So we really recommend those books. Um, we recently uh, came out with an in-hand guide to diurnal North American raptors. So it's it's more tailored to birds that are again captured and, and physically in the hand at migration sites. But if you're really interested in these like in the minutia of, of uh, details of what these birds look like up close, uh, it certainly can, uh, those details can certainly improve your hawk watching uh, abilities. So I recommend checking those books all out. And more recently, uh, Hawkwatch International, in collaboration with Cornell Lab of Ornithology, came out with the Raptor ID app. It is free. So uh, I'll say that again. It's a free app. And it's probably the best resource that exists. Uh, I'm, I'm biased, of course, but the best resource that exists, exists for identifying raptors in North America. Uh, it's really cool because it has high quality photos of, of each of the diurnal species, uh, as well as high quality video. And the video is actually narrated by 
Jerry Ligori, so he can you can listen to him and you can kind of plan out ID tips while you're physically in the field. So I recommend using this app if you're just sitting at home, like looking at photos, or if you're physically like at a location looking at birds, this is kind of the way to go. And you can get it on um, iPhones or iPads as well as Android devices. So this is a really good resource and I recommend getting it. And you said that that app is free, right? Yes, I did yeah. say that twice. That's, that's a lot of knowledge there for just some some memory space on your phone. It really it really um, seems to be a, a game changer of what we heard from people that have used it, and we're we're pretty proud to have been a part of of, of working with Jerry and Brian to make it happen. Um, the video, the images, the narration. Uh, it links to eBird. It's got range maps. It's got links to um, vocalizations. It's it's really kind of taken um, field guides to to the next level. So we're we're pretty proud of it. So um, we're going to go through fairly quickly um, some general tips for flight ID of raptors, but this is these tips are are probably hold for bird ID at all. So if you're you know if you're new to birding or new to raptor ID, these are things to hopefully keep in mind as as you're as you're building your skills. And if you're an experienced hawk, hawk watcher, maybe these are things that you already knew, um, but it's sometimes it's nice to to, to, to kind of have them. Um, brought back up to mind and we'll kind of go through them pretty quickly. But one of the, the first is that when you're looking at a bird, particularly a raptor in flight, um, I like to encourage people to approach it like you're a detective, right? You want to find multiple lines of evidence that get you to your identif identification call. You don't want to necessarily use one thing if you don't have to. A lot of times you can get into trouble if you stick to just one diagnostic feature, particularly with the groups that we're going to talk about today. So you want to basically see a number of things and triangulate um, to what your ID is. So use use a lot of characteristics if you can. What else, Jesse? Yeah, so birding is not a race, and that applies to hawk watching as well. You don't want to be that person uh, who we all know who is trying to be the first one to blurt out what bird they're seeing. There's no race. We're all there together. Um, we can all work together to come to an identification. Um, it's, of course, fun if, if you know what it is right away, but there's no reason to, to kind of blurt that out. And, and the risk of, of doing that is you may, uh, you may make the wrong call, and, and that doesn't feel great. Uh, and there's no real reason for it. Um, as as you'll see as we talk today, like the longer you wait and the more patient you are and the more characteristics that you can kind of pick up, it's kind of like piecing a puzzle together. Uh, all the pieces fit together to lead to your identification. And if you're just basing it on one quick thing that you saw, uh, you might find yourself in trouble. So my recommendation is just be patient and, and work towards that ID. Yeah. For sure, um, and and kind of paired with with that, um, as you watch the bird and you build the the case for what you think it is, um, you know, don't hesitate to guess. Particularly if you're you're a new birder, a lot of folks will just wait to see what the experienced person thinks it is, and they'll just go with it. Um, but you you want to you want to use the cues and and come up with your own um, call, which can be wrong, and and you shouldn't be afraid to be wrong. You can learn from being wrong. I learn a lot from being wrong. Um, but uh, so do that. So so don't be afraid to 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 make a call and then have it be wrong and learn from the other people that you might be out there with um, why they made a different call. And um, that's a great way to learn. Uh, the other thing is to keep in mind, particularly in in the the realm of hawk watching and like a migration site and counting. Um, but in general too, is that you can't identify everything all the time, right? There'll be birds that are just too fast or you don't get the look that you really need to make a strong call for. Um, and that's fine too. Um, and in our, our long-term monitoring sites, we have a category, a button on our, 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 our tablets that we enter data on um, that we have an unknown raptor. We know it was a bird of prey, but we didn't see enough to know anything else with, and that's fine. Uh, and then we have unknown occipiter. And and the other groups, and you know, we don't want all of our count to be within that category. But there are some birds that you just have to to put into a broader bin than down to species level or subspecies level. And so you want to be confident and conservative in your calls, particularly if you're working at a long-term monitoring site where um, we want to know and have confidence that 
that we're not forcing birds into into categories. Yeah, and for me, I like to just kind of think about it like you're always you're a hundred percent of the time correct if you call a bird unknown. Uh, it doesn't maybe feel as good because you want to get to the bottom of it, kind of the bottom of that detective story, like Dave is saying, and and identify it to the best of your ability, but that ability may leave you at unknown. And that's okay, because that, that bird has been correctly identified as, as unknown, and that's that's it, we move on to the next one. Um, and realizing what you don't see can be as important as what you do. And so that kind of goes back to the second point that I was making. Um, if you kind of have a knee-jerk reaction and see something and identify it, right off the bat based on that characteristic, uh, you might regret that because there may be other things that you haven't seen yet or won't see. Um, and so the best thing is to be patient. And sometimes if you don't see something that that identifying that that characteristic is not present can also lead you to an identification. So uh, just kind of keep an open mind and, and take in all the information that you can uh, and, and build that picture of what you're looking at. Yeah, the other thing is, particularly if you're just getting started, and we'll spend a little more time here shortly um, talking about this, is learn your big groups first. If you if you know the characteristics and you can get a raptor in flight into the occipiter group or the budio group or the falcon group, and then start to work down, that's the that's a great place to start, right? And that's why we have unknown categories of all of those groups. Like if it's an unknown, unknown raptor, like Jesse was talking about, that's what it is. Um, but if we can get it down to the next level of being a falcon or something else, that's useful. Um, and then if we can drill down even further, um, that's that's good too. So we start with talking about big category characteristics, and then we move into um, characteristics of the species, and then even more in some groups. Bottom line uh, is is make sure you're having fun. If if you're not having fun and enjoying being out there trying to identify raptors, um, then why why are you doing it in the first place? Uh, these birds are awesome. It's it's a it's a challenge, um, and I like to think that you can. It's a challenge that you can never really defeat or come out on top. Uh, you you can always improve your skills. There's always something new to learn. That's probably why you're all here today, uh, but. For, for folks who have watched Raptors for years and years and years, there's always ways to improve and new things to pick up on. Um, and that's part of the part of the fun is, is just continuing to build your tool set. So don't be discouraged if, if you don't know what it is or you have trouble with Sharp Shand and Cooper's Hawks, um, you know, continue to build your tool set and, and you'll get better. So with those general tips, we'll talk a little bit more about the, the keys to identifying raptors in flight. And uh, Jesse kind of alluded to it when he was talking about the guides. Um, you know, your typical field guide has these drawings or images and, and arrows that highlight a lot of like diagnostic features that are easy to see on a bird that's sitting still or a bird that's perched. Um, and, and if you have good photography equipment, a bird in flight that you get a great picture on that you can zoom in, that, that helps too. Um, but at um, long-term monitoring sites like we run and, and sort of uh, identifying and making calls of birds that are moving in flight, sometimes rather quickly. Um, it's a kind of a different kind of birding, really. You're looking not so much for those, those plumage characteristics first and those really um, minute details, but you're looking for, for um, broader characteristics like shape. Shape is gonna be one of the key things um, for identifying raptors in flight, um, regardless of group. Um, and so you're going to want to look and watch the bird as it goes by and, and kind of lock into your mind what, you know, what the bird looked like. Was it, was it compact and stocky? Um, was it long and lanky? Uh, the wings, if you saw them, um, for the most part, depending on what the bird was doing, were they rounded or were they pointed? Um, did they, did, were, they, were they long relative to the tail or short relative to the tail? Um, what were they, you know, what did the head do? Um, we're looking for things like shape and shape becomes very important. Shape is the first thing um, you want to start with when you're talking about a raptor in flight. So coupled with shape, uh, the next thing is the flight manner, the mannerisms. Uh, so you've got a bird in the air. Uh, these birds are all moving and are they moving fast or slow? What do the wing, wing beats look like? Are they beating the wings really quickly? Um, are they beating really inconsistently? 
or, or slow? Um, are they are they deep or shallow wing beats? Um, and how does the wind affect them as as they're moving? <clears throat> excuse me, through the sky. Um, uh, generally, and this will come to play in, in as we move on, but generally a larger bird makes sense, isn't blown around by the wind as much. So they appear much more steady. And, and at distance, imagine seeing a bird at say a kilometer versus 100 meters uh, at, at distance, those flight mannerisms can really be useful because you might not be able to make out uh, other characteristics of the bird, but you can still see the movement through your binoculars, how, how the bird is flapping and, and if the bird is getting pushed by that wind. So after shape and after flight and, and behavior, then some of those plumage characteristics that are more in a typical field guide, um, those are handy. We don't want to say that they're not useful at all. Um, you may see a bird from a distance that's soaring, and if the light is right and the angle of the bird soaring is right, all of a sudden you get a flash of a red tail. And if it's a long-winged, short-tailed bird, um, that gets you to a red-tailed hawk usually pretty easily. There's there's some plumage characteristics that will, will help you get the ID right. There's also some plumage characteristics that will help you get um, age class for some birds, whether they're juveniles or they're adults, or for some of uh, other birds, there's multiple classes that we'll talk about when we get to those points. But plumage is important. But we're, again, we're trying to highlight the first thing you want to you know cue in on are the shape and the behavior. Uh, and those are things that come across from a very far distance. Um, the other traits kind of start to get washed out sometimes. Yeah, so plumage is a, bon a bonus. You know, if you're lucky and you get a good enough look and the light is right and you're close enough, then bonus, you, you've got plumage and you can kind of add that in to paint your picture with shape and flight mannerism. And lastly, you've got the habitat and the season. And you can kind of, you can know that this is the one that you can kind of uh, know ahead of time. And so you know ahead of time, like, okay, this is where I am. So these are the type of birds that I would expect in this region and this type of habitat. Um, you know, for example, mid midsummer, you would maybe you see a bird, a Budio species in, in the southern states, maybe Texas, and it's got feathered legs. And so that kind of narrows it down to two species, a rough legged hawk or a ferruginous hawk. And knowing the habitat that you're in, and in this case, more relevant, the season, um, you can kind of rule out that it's a rough legged hawk because rough legged hawk could be up in the Arctic breeding at that period. Um, and so again, using all these four major characteristics to kind of paint the picture is, is how you should approach each raptor that you're identifying. So um, we'll kind of go through these really quick. And we, this was one of our first points was like, if you're just learning, start to learn the groups of hawks. And so um, we're gonna focus on the exhibitors today but they're a group of hawks that you can get by shape. They're the forest hawks. Accipiter species have short rounded wings. You can see the profile right here, uh, a relatively long tail. And they're, they're essentially built for maneuvering through dense vegetation and chasing prey through vegetation at close quarters. And so that long tail acts like a rudder and allows them to do that. And you can watch Cooper's hawks like run through the vegetation trying to catch their, their prey. It's, it's a lot of fun if you're lucky enough to be there. But the accipiters have that short rounded wings long tail. <clears throat> and something to point out before we talk about Budios is our categorization of hawks applies to all these different groups. And so you might say, oh, it's an eagle. It's not a hawk. Yes, technically that's true. But when we say hawks, we're, we're kind of grouping everything together. Um, hence the hawk watch uh, when you use that term. So just keep that in mind if you haven't heard that before. Uh, Budios, some, some people will call them Budios. I typically call them Budios. Uh, they're the soaring hawks. They include uh, ferruginous hawks, red-tailed hawks, uh, red-shouldered hawks. I won't go through the whole list, but those, those type of, of hawks, they have long rounded wings, um, a long tail, and they're really built for soaring. And they typically prey on quite a few rodent species, not exclusively, of course. Uh, but because of that, they're they're hunting often from from the air, from the wing. Uh, but they also spend a lot of time hunting uh, from a perch. So we'll talk about those, I believe, on Friday. 
the uh, the next group are the, the falcons. So falcons are built for speed. They've got long pointed wings um, and a long tail, and they're built to, to chase their prey down from behind and just basically be the faster um, bird. They eat a lot of birds. And so falcons are built for speed. The other um, group we'll talk about today are the kites, and, and, and most of the kites, the kites, definitely all the kites that we'll talk about also have these long pointed wings that are, are um, speed and agility kind of um, characteristics. The eagles, uh, they're somewhat unmistakable, especially if you get a, a good look. Um, in North America, we have two eagle species, generally um, at least two that you're going to see at hawk watches, and those would be bald eagles and golden eagles. Um, they're massive, super broad wings, very powerful. Uh, going back to the comment about uh, in flight and how they're affected by the wind, they're so powerful and strong that generally the wind, even extremely strong winds, won't push them around nearly as much as a smaller bird. And my, my favorite statement, um, eagles are built to do whatever they want. And so they, they kind of rule the roost. And, and if they want to go over here or go over there or fly up here, perch here, they will do that because they are big and powerful and in charge. Uh, and so the other, these are the main categories of, of raptor hawk that we're going to be talking about. Uh, but worth worth noting again, kites are not on here, but but we will be talking about kites, some similarities with falcons, um, and then we'll we'll get into some of the oddballs, if you will, uh, turkey vulture, black vulture, um, osprey, northern harrier. We'll we'll talk about those as well uh, here in the future. I think I called them the med that'll be the medley session, not the not the oddball session. Just they're not oddballs. Yeah, they're <laughs> in the medley section. Great. So let's dive into the exhibitors. That's what we're, what we're here to talk about. Um, so these are the forest hawks. Again, you get that short round wing, that long tail, and the three North American species that we're gonna, we're gonna talk about are the sharp shinned hawk, the Cooper's hawk, and the Northern goshawk. Um, and this is the group. Uh, we're, we're taking care of the tough one right, right off the bat. I think that's the way to, to, to face it, is, is this is the, the most challenging group of, of raptors. Um, for a lot of people, and it's for, for good reason. All of the juvenile plumage for all three of these species looks very similar. They all are shaped somewhat similar. Um, and then when they go to adult plumage, um, sharp chin hawk and Cooper's hawk have similar plumage. Northern goshawks start to become a little more um, distinct by then, and we'll talk about that. But they're a lot alike. They range in size, um, but size is one of those things that, especially for a bird in flight, size is hard to judge. And um, that's why it's shape and behavior and then plumage are things that we key in on more than size because a very big bird will look very small from far away and vice versa, right? And so you want to make sure that um, that you're, you're looking for um, cues that are a little more reliable than size. Sitting right next to each other, size is great, but that rarely happens, right? So... Let's dive into the sharp shinned hawk. Sharp shinned hawks are our smallest exhibitor species. Um, here is an adult pictured in, in glide here. And you can see the adult plumage for both sharp shinned hawks and, and coopers. We'll mention it now because we, we want to be efficient with our time. Um, they have barred rufous and white barring underneath is their adult plumage. Um, you can see the kind of gray dark gray blue on on the back um, for the for the adult plumage but we're again we're going to key in on shape so that's why you've got a shaded out image of a sharp shinned hawk up in the upper right of the, of the screen short round wings long narrow tail um, another key thing to look about is is notice how we talk a lot about head projection and and, and what the head looks like relative to the the leading edge of the wings so here's the leading edge of the wings and here's the head um, and this bird has a head that, you know, sharp shin hawks have heads, they extend out from the body, um, but relative and, and compared to other species, this head does not extend very far beyond um, that leading edge of the wing. And in the right posture, it doesn't extend at all. You can see the wrists up in this profile. See that head doesn't extend. And that's going to be different than our, our next species. So um, these are some of the, the things to start to key in on. Uh, you have anything to add, Jesse? No, I think I think that's good. Nice, nice spot to kick it off. Go to the next one. Um, yeah, I can talk about the the range of these birds. They're pretty pretty widespread across North America. 
Um, this is a widely available map that you can actually check out and view on eBird. And so these birds move, they're all the way up into Alaska, um, all the way to the East Coast as well. And they're generally seen across all of the migration sites in North America. So they're very widespread, common, uh, common at migration sites, I should say. And there's actually some subspecies that are uh, down in the Central and South America. So here's a more typical than the zoomed in great image that we showed of, of an adult sharpshin um, previously. This is a little bit higher up. You can see that the, the plumage characteristics start to disappear. But what you still see here is short round wings. And you can, again, this is a nice one to see that the wrists kind of jut forward. And so if I draw a line along the leading edge of that wing, you can see that the head does not project very much beyond that at all. Um, the other the other thing to look for and pair with these kinds of shapes is to see the squarish tail of the occipiter here, the, the sharp shinned hawk. It's mostly square. Um, we always give a caveat when we talk about tail shape is that tails are made from feathers. Tails are held in different places. They can um, be worn and beaten and so um, tips wear off and can change the shape. So Typically, that's one of those characteristics you want to be careful about and use along with other um, things that you see to get to a species and not use just the tail shape because you can go wrong pretty quick, right, Jesse? Yeah, yeah, and I like I like this picture. Just it shows like how stout these these birds are. Um, just short little head, uh, kind of a stout little chest, and kind of just a small compact package. Um, so yeah, smallest and most compact of the exhibitors. And they're also the smallest hawk species that we have in, in North America, uh, particularly the male uh, sharpshin hawk is, is very small. All right. There's a top side image, um, much of the same of what we're talking about. Um, you can kind of see the tail looks somewhat squared off, but it actually looks like it has some feather wear, so it doesn't quite look completely square. Anything you want to add to that one, Dave? No, not really. I mean, again, this is more, you're not going to get this great of a look a lot of times at a hawk watch site, right? But if you get this great of a look, you can see that the eye is, is fairly big in that head. It's more of a round head, um, not the Roman nose of, like that you get in the next species that we'll talk about. But uh, we'll just stick to, to shape. Okay. I think we're going to get to video next, right? Or pretty yeah, soon. One, one more. So we've got a juvenile sharp shinned hawk here. This is more of a typical look, a little more distant. Um, you can see it's juvenile, it doesn't have that kind of colored barring uh, that we saw on the adult from the underside. Nice squared tail. The tail is closed. Um, here's a better look. This is like pretty comparable to the silhouette if you look at the wing shape. So you've got those wrists that are kind of jutting forward, makes a little pocket where the head is, and the head is slightly ahead, ahead of that pocket. Um, but again, not a lot of head projection and, and, and again, short and compact. So that's a real typical look that you would get of a sharp shin. Here's a video. Go ahead, Dave. So we're, uh... This is pretty good. I, the, the transfer of technology from a video to a PowerPoint to the web kind of has made things a little choppy here. But as you watch the bird, again, you're going to look for shape. We're going to look while a bird that's moving, what, what's it doing? Is it flapping a lot? Um, how is it flapping? How tight are the circles that it's turning? And then sort of like yeah, Jesse mentioned good. before, like what's what's it doing in, in the wind? Is it getting bounced around a lot? Is it elevating and buffeted? Um, for this species, these are pretty tight circles. Um, if our video was moving a little more real to life fast, you'd see those are snappy wing beats and they're mostly from the wrist out of the wing. Um, and is that the second one, Jesse? That was not, I played the first one twice. Here's the second one. So this is a bird coming towards us. For me, it's a little smoother, probably quick snappy wing beats. A lot of the, the wing beat is actually from the wrist outward, so it's not not really the full wing flapping like we'll see with the Cooper's hawk. 
Um, and you can see the bird right there kind of got buffeted by the wind, pushed around. Uh, the smaller bird, again, not as much body mass, so that wind really affects it and, and pushes it around. I mean, and when they are soaring in circles um, in, in thermals, they're pretty tight uh, because they're They've got a just like a just like a smaller vehicle. If you've got a slug bug versus a big truck, uh, you can turn much tighter circles. Yeah, you can park your Jeep anywhere, but you get once you get to the Tahoe, it's a little harder to, to parallel park, right? Um, so that's the sharp shin hawk. We're going to go through Cooper's hawk and Goss hawk, and then kind of synthesize and talk about them all three together here. So um, bear bear with us. Um, our medium size. Uh, the excipiter species is the Cooper's hawk that you see an adult pictured here. And so it's just scaled up in terms of size and bulkiness. Um, the body of this bird, if you're looking at body, is, is um, substantial, but it's not as stocky and chunky looking and top heavy as a sharp shin hawk will look at times. And then the, 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 you know one of the key things you can see in this silhouette here, and also the image of this bird is if we take a straight line from the, the leading line of the wings, there's a lot of head projection out ahead of those those wings right uh, longer tail relative to the body um, for, for cooper's hawks they look a little stretched out they don't look compact and hunched like a sharp chin hawk they look uh stretched out and lankier um, than than sharpies yeah so that that goes for the wings too the the wings everything is proportionally bigger because they're a bigger bird but tail is longer and, and comparably it's it's very thin. The wings are narrow and and long, and there are there is more head projection than a sharp. You can see that this both the silhouette and this this image here. You can see the tip of the tail. It, it appears rounded. Again, remember that's not something to hang your hat on all the time, but it is is a good clue. And in the actual image, you can see um, that the outer tail feathers of, of Cooper's hawks are actually shorter than the inner tail feathers. And that's what creates that rounded look. And you can see the gradation on the tail right oh, there. Right. So right. if you right. if you got powerful enough optics or the bird's close enough that you get that kind of a look, that's a really useful thing to look for. Here's the range of Cooper's hawks. This is from eBird data. And so a um, little more broadly distributed than the sharp shin hawk. And the other thing that you can kind of see is there's a whole lot of purple here. Um, we're seeing more and more Cooper's hawks and populations in, in different regions that are sticking around year round, um, probably because they're, they're, they're food, their uh, robins and sort of medium mid-sized songbirds are sticking around in a lot of places. And you could probably link that to, to bird feeders and, and, and urbanization. And there's a lot, lots of cities across North America have year-round populations of, of Cooper's hawks um, present nowadays. Yeah, and if you're on like any of the Raptor ID Facebook pages or any of the bird pages, um, very often Cooper's hawks are the birds that get posted. Um, you know, what is this bird? It, it was hunting my, my songbirds at my feeders. And I wouldn't say nine times out of 10, but uh, quite often Cooper's hawks, especially juvenile Cooper's hawks, um, they're a bird that you often see popping up on the scene. So if you live if you live in an urban setting or even rural setting, um, not unlikely that you're going to have Cooper socks visiting your yard, if, especially if you're feeding birds. So here's a topside look at an adult Cooper sock. Uh, I like this image. You can see, um, remember the the pocket we talked about with the. Uh, Chirpshin hawk when their wings are kind of jetted forward and they've they've got that pocket where their head is fit in. This bird is is moving forward, and its leading edge of the wing. So again, just right right. Uh, let me let me highlight it. Leading at the edge of the wings right here is generally pretty perpendicular to where the head is, um, kind of straight across. And you can see this bird. Um, it's got Kind of a rounded tail it's a little difficult to see with that image um, but then the other thing here if you get a good enough look is this dark cap um, so that's just you'll, you'll actually see this in the video that we point out right here it's it's really dark and this part on the back of the head is not dark like that uh, which is something that you would see in a, <clears throat> a sharp shinned hawk so keep an eye out on that on, on one of the videos that we show anything you want to add there dave no i think that's good 
Here's a, um, a, a underside view of a juvenile um, plumage Cooper's hawk. And you can see uh, the shape is very similar to the adults, but what, what you see here instead is, um, like I mentioned before, all three juvenile occipiter species have varying degrees of, of white and brown streaking on the underside. Um, and then you can see here, the Cooper's hawk are, for the most part, lightly streaked, and the streaking tends to be kind of like teardrops or comma shapes and, and isn't heavy, whereas in the um, most sharp shin hawk juveniles, their streaking is thicker and heavier, and it looks like someone took a thick marker and made those all sort of not this nice teardrop um, shape. And so um, sometimes that distinction can be a clue that you use to get you to an ID, but again, it, there's there's gradation there, so don't use it in and of itself. Um, what you can also see here is um, a long tail, but also kind of just that that tawny um, color to the head and, and over to the back of the juvenile Cooper's hawk is, is pretty distinct. And so this is this is a great um, image of you. If you're lucky enough to get this close of a look, you should hopefully have a pretty easy job making the ID call. Yeah, so here flipping that that bird over, this is this is a different individual. Um, but a juvenile Cooper talk, you can see that tawny color on the top side. Um, notice the tail looks a little beat up. This is a fresh uh, juvenile bird. And so its feathers are relatively new, but you can still see that rounded tail. Um, looks pretty similar to the silhouette, but they are based on different individuals. Uh, so tawny on the top side, notice that head projection uh, front kind of perpendicular leading edge of the wing we talked about. Notice the superciliary line above the bird's eye. Uh, this can be present on all of the occipiter species, and it's often kind of a stumbling block, I think, for folks who really associate that with a northern goshawk. And we'll see that with northern goshawk. It's it's even more pronounced, uh, but you can see it with the Cooper's hawk, and you can see it with the sharp shin hawk, too. So this is a good example um, kind of highlighting that. Yeah, this might um this is a nice spot too, I think, and we haven't hit on um some goshawk characteristics, but this is a nice example of if you know what to look for or to notice what you don't see can help you get to an ID too. On a mm -hmm. on a picture like this, um rather rather um large brown bird uh, on a goshawk, we would have some white modeling in the upper wing coverts here that would um that would show up in a goshawk, a juvenile goshawk. Um, and you'd have some tail banding, the waviness of the tail band, and we'll talk about that in a minute. I don't see either of those things here, and the, the fact that I don't see those would help me um, start to go towards Cooper's hawk over Goss hawk um, in, in this case, right? So it's, sometimes it's, it's the things that you don't see can get you to an ID too. All right, so our video, two videos. Here's a Cooper's hawk. Let me pause this one. Pause it right there. You can kind of see the wings are up, so it's a little tricky. Uh, but you can see that dark cap. Again, you're going to have to kind of get lucky uh, in flight seeing it that quickly. But this is an adult bird. Looks like it's got a full crop. It must have just eaten some food. Um, but you can see that dark uh, cap on the top that we talked about. Keep an eye out for that as the bird's moving along. Notice the white tip on the tail when it turns. Really good head projection compared to the sharp shin. And uh, the video doesn't do it justice in how choppy it is, but um, like the wing beats of Cooper's hawks are not, you wouldn't describe them as snappy. You might describe them as more stiff and it's not a wing beat from the wrist out that's so super lightning fast like a sharp shin hawk. It's more full wing beat and not as rapid and definitely not as frequent. The, the sharp shin hawk is gonna be that, that frequent flapper compared to the other two receptor species. All right, that's the same video. So we'll go to the second one. So here's a bird that is soaring. So you can, I don't think we've, we pointed this out yet. Um, there's a slight dihedral when the bird is soaring with Cooper talk. So dihedral, if you haven't heard that word before, imagine the bird's wings are straight out these are my wings. Uh, dihedral would be slightly up like this. Turkey vulture or another other types of birds have kind of a, uh, more of the pointed wings upward. Um, notice there's a little bit of head projection that you can see. You can see that tail has more roundedness to it in this example. And 
it's hard to get a feeling for how this bird is moving in the wind or if there is much wind here, but not getting blown around as much as, as a sharp shin hawk would. Then our, our last exhibitor species is the northern goshawk. It's the big SUV um, version of, of our three North American exhibitors. Um, and if you're lucky enough to get an adult view in this close of an adult view, it'll be the easiest of the exhibitors to, to identify. It's, it's pretty distinct in adult plumage with the, um, the black and white or gray and white barring, versus, which is different than the rufous and white barring that the other two species have. And then you've got this um, very distinct white superciliary line that you can see there. Um, pretty, pretty common, pretty easy to see. The other thing that I hope you notice about this picture is that is a solid stout body from head all the way down through the tail on this bird um, relative to the other two species. So a really stout bodied bird um, with this kind of plumage is, is um, fairly, fairly easy call to make for northern goshawk. Um, once you start getting birds that are farther away, um, you can still see that stockiness of the body and that it extends through the tail. Um, but we'll talk about some some other characteristics. Do you want to add anything here, Jesse? Just how how you know big every feature of the bird is compared to the other exhibitors we've talked about. Uh, the tail's not spread here. We'll have some good images showing the spread tail, but you can tell it's like very long. It's it's stout tail. And then you go move up to the the breast and the chest, and it's just stout and big. Um, and the wings are broader and, and just big. big. Think, yeah, you can see that broad wing. Uh, the next silhouette might show it well too, but you, so it's, these are the primary flight feathers and then these are the secondaries and they're quite long and they bulge out. So they're long and they, they make the wing look like a, you know, a toned muscled arm looks like more of a weightlifter in here um, than, than you see on the other two species. It's worth pointing out the tail can kind of vary. So it can be squared off, it can be rounded, um, it's always going to be pretty broad, um, it can be wedged. So tail, you know, this is again where using more multiple characteristics is is key. You wouldn't want to see one tail and say, oh, it was squared off, so it was a cooper's hawk, or a, sorry, a sharpson hawk. You'd, you'd want to uh, use all these characteristics and come to your, your conclusion. Northern goshawk range, this is a m mainly an older forest, upper elevation, um, breeder that moved down in the winter in some places, so it's not uncommon to see them sort of in lowlands, Great Basin area on, on occasion, but that's uh, fairly um, of of the sp three occipiter species has the, the most limited distribution and probably lowest, lowest density. All right, so here's a nice, nice topside image. Um, notice that bright superciliary line above the eye, bright red eye. Uh, if, you're, if you see that, you're going to be lucky. Um, maybe if you get an image like this, you could see it. Super broad tail, gray on the top for this adult, and, and everything, again, is, is large and, and broad. Anything to add there? No, I mean, yeah, that, that's pretty it. That is, a, that is a stout bird from head to toe. Um, and it's, I guess, and, and we'll see it in the video a little more, but like of of the three exhibitor species, lots of people will describe um, the wing flap and, and just the build and, and behavior of the goshawk is that it conjures um, budio. Like it's, it, it seems more, if, it, if it's an exhibitor and you get the vibe that it's a budio, then you're, there's a good chance that you're looking at a northern goshawk. A little more distant of a shot. This is still uh, an adult bird from the underside. Notice how massive the tail is compared to the other exhibitors we've talked about. Big wings again and super bulky chest. Um, I think if, if we had the other exhibitors right next to this bird, um, it would be quite apparent that this, this bird is just super bulky in, in all of those aspects. Here's a juvenile northern goshawk. Again, you can see, you see just like the other two species, the juvenile plumage is um, white and brown streaked. This is much heavier, heavy marked bird. Um, and what you can see is you still see a bold white superciliary line. Um, and the other two things for, um, you know, from plumage distinctions, which you can see in this close up image is that um, 
the under tail coverts, which are right in this area, so it's the the body plumage that, that covers up the, the tail and, and kind of blends in, they are marked and streaked. And so you can see that here. Um, you'll get occasional streaking for the uh, on, on the undertail coverts of some of the other species, but not a ton. And it's pretty reliable with this heavy streaking and this amount of heavy streaking on those coverts. Um, it's a northern goshawk. And then we're talking we, about these feathers. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Thanks. That's, that's your mouse better than the pointer. Yeah, so the, these, we're looking at the spotting at these feathers that are under tail coverts is what they're called. So that's a nice characteristic. And it, and it's not it's not to say that the other exhibitors, particularly Cooper's Hawk, can't have those marked under tail coverts because they can. Um, but but just notice how, how bold the, the markings are on this bird and all the way down into the coverts. And then uh, I'll also point out the wavy tail bands Dave had mentioned earlier. Again, we've got a mo massive broad tail, and these bands are not as consistent, if you if that's the right word, as as the Cooper socks, where they were kind of the same width all the way across on each band. These ones are wavy, um, inconsistent, and there's variation. They can be more consistent, and that can become more confusing, which is when you'd want to, as always, use more characteristics in your ID. Uh, but that that is a nice, generally consistent characteristic with northern goshawks, especially on these two little birds. So here's a video. And, and even right away, just when it came around, you could see how um, stout the body is throughout the the upper look. How super steady and powerful in flight. It's not really flapping yet. can kind of be confused with the Budio uh, just, just because those wings are, you know, broad and, and wing beats are stiff and strong. Um, really long tail, holds the wings fairly flat in a, in a slide, not up in a dihedral. So this one's quick. Uh, I'm not sure how choppy it is for you guys, but this is a nice image showing or nice video showing how powerful these birds are are when they're moving through. And this is kind of a typical look. The, one, the reason I included, I'll play it again. The reason I included this one is this is kind of what you expect to see often with with a goshawk. You're, you're at a hawk watch, you're watching the birds move by, and then all of a sudden this powerful bird zooms past low in the trees. Um, and that's pretty characteristic of, of the northern goshawk. Look at this frozen image, you can actually see that superciliary line on this juvenile bird. And so we'll watch it again. Zooms right past low through the trees, doing what it does, what it specializes on. And it's much more fluid, elegant wing beat that's more like a like a budio than than say the choppy, snappy, sharp shin hawk, a very stiff super hawk beat. All right. Next here we go, Dave. So that <laughs> we could do a whole day on, on, I think, this group if we wanted to, Jesse. But so so uh, kind of pulling all three of those exhibitor species together into a table to kind of give you like a cue of these are the things that like I try to see. I think a lot, lots of people try to see when, when an, an exhibitor species comes by, you think about what the wing beats look like. Are they are they snappy and frequent and just from the wrists out uh, and, and happen a lot like sharp shinned hawks? Um, are they more stiff, less frequent, and seeming more powerful um, in almost the whole wing, like a Cooper's Hawk? Um, or are they that fluid, powerful, um, Budio-esque type flight and makes you think of a soaring hawk like the northern goshawk? So you can think of wing beats like that. Uh, in flight, there's a lot of differences between these species. Um, as When you start smaller and go larger, uh, Chirpshin Hawk is more buoyant. They rise faster. They get pushed around much more significantly by the wind just due to the fact that they are smaller and don't have as much body mass. Um, move up to Cooper's Hawks, they, they are more steady in flight. Um, they have more control, don't get blown around in the wind as much. Um, remember that their wings kind of relative to their head kind of have that perpendicular look, uh, slight dihedral in the air. And then as you get up to Goshawk, as we just shot, saw in the video, much more steady and, and uh, powerful due to their size and strength in, in the sky. 
So you know, that that fight, what are they doing? And these are all like you want multiple cues and things to look for. Um, if you get a good look at the the body of the bird, you want to want to think about that too. And, and there's some differences between these three species there. Uh, stocky, sort of top heavy feel of of the sharp shin hawk in terms of the body. The Cooper's hawk body is more lanky and tubular and, and extends throughout like the whole bird. And then um, the goshawk is uh, super stout throughout, extending to a really broad tail that looks just like an extension of the body in terms of of the um, shape for for that species. And so those are the things to look for um, to help you pinpoint or narrow down which of these three species you might look like be looking at for for the body. As far as tails go, um, sharp shin hawk is the, all all the tails are long uh, because they are exhibitors, but Sharp shin hawk relative has a long tail. It's narrow and it's generally squared. We have an asterisk there for both Cooper's hawk and sharp shin hawk because there can be variation. Uh, but uh, yeah, typically it's going to be a squared tail when it's closed. As you move up to the Cooper's hawk, long and broad again, um, relatively narrower wings but bigger, long tail, um, and you've got rounded tail typically. Um, and with you get when you get up to the goshawk, um, everything is broad again, broad tail. Their tail is super long, kind of an extension of their body, and it can be variable, like I talked about, wedged, rounded, more squared. Um, yeah. The projection, Dave. Yeah, head, and then then there's the head projection. And I guess real quick, if you um, just a quick reminder, if you're you're viewing, to to please make sure that you are on mute. So we don't get any kind of re reverb or, or background noise. Um, so sharp shin hawks, uh, you know, you want to look and see how the head is projecting beyond the leading line of the wings in, in different different projections. And um, the sharp shin hawk will not project incredibly far, if at all, um, past past those wings, depending on the posture of the bird. Whereas the the Cooper's hawk will have a head that extends quite a bit beyond that leading edge. Um, and the goshawk will as well, depending on how wings are held, and it's got a large head that extends um, beyond the leading edge in a lot of different postures. And so all of those things together, this isn't a complete or perfect table. I think we're still building that and working on that. Um, but you know, hopefully these are things that will work for some of you in, in helping you narrow down um, those exhibitor IDs. Um, and now you didn't know you signed up for it, but we're going to do a uh, an exhibitor quiz. We're going to we're going to flip to an image and be quiet here for a minute, and you're going to see four different panels with letters. and And take a second, and based on the things that we've been talking about today, um, look at each of those birds and try to use more than one cue, and and uh, jot down or just you know mark in your head what you think it is, and then we'll talk about each one of those here pretty quickly. You want to switch to the here it is. We'll go through these in one more minute. Remember, there's nothing wrong with being wrong. It's the best way to, to figure things out is to, to look and make a guess. And we'll talk about what, what we see to make us make the ID call on these images. All right, you want to you want to start, Jesse? Sure, I can't see folks comments if they are commenting, so. Um, but yeah, we'll start on the top left. Let's talk about A, and I, yeah, I guess if you know if you really are into it and want to put your get your call in the chat, feel free to do that. Otherwise, that's fine too. We'll we'll talk about what we see in this bird. Yeah, so for this bird, I see a pretty big looking bird. It's broad throughout. I can actually see it looks like a white eye line. It's a juvenile. It's got a broad tail, looks like some wavy tail bands, even marked, un, marked undertail coverts. And what else do I see? That's that's kind of the, those are the things that kind of come to my eye first. What about you, Dave? Yeah, all of those things, the, the really kind of muscular, um, long secondaries on the wing, kind of bulging broad wings. So when we say broad, we're talking about how 
the wing is this way, right? This is the length, this is the broad. Uh, Tailwise, this is being a broad tail, this is having a long tail this way, right? Um, thinking about it that way. So I see, yeah, all those pretty heavy markings. Even, did you mention, I think I can see some markings on those undertail coverage there. Yep. yep. So what do we call it? That's, that is a northern goshawk. Juvenile northern goshawk. So with B over on the top right for us, at least, um, not as great of an image, but that's probably more consistent with what you would see in the field. Um, it's an exhibitor. I can tell that because it's got a long tail. Um, looks like it's relatively short wings. I can kind of see an eye line again, which is interesting. I uh, can't see the underside of the tail. And the head is lit up, which is useful. It looks like the head projects a little bit past the wings. So that's useful. Overall, it doesn't look like as stocky as I would expect in a sharp shin hawk. And it doesn't look as broad across in, in all characteristics as I would expect in a northern goshawk. Um, what, what else do you see there, Dave? I think I've probably given away what we think it is. Yeah, I think all of those things, sort of the, the light that's hitting this bird shows me a little bit of tawny on that head that projects quite a bit out, right? And we, we discussed that. Don't see a whole lot to tell me anything about tail shape, but based on those other things that you were um, pointing out, Jesse, this is this is a juvenile Cooper's hawk. Yeah. So with C, bottom left, uh, I see an exhibitor again. Looks like a long tail. Looks like a a younger bird. Um, can it's a really tough angle. Um, hard to really tell how much the head projects. It kind of looks like it's consistent with the wings. Maybe the the wrists are forward a little bit. Um, the tail is turned nicely. Can't really see how wavy the tail bands are. Um, looks like a pretty short, uh, I shouldn't say short, but looks like a straight cut tail across, kind of squared off. Um, pretty heavy marking underneath. Can't really see any tawny that Dave mentioned. Can still see that, that white eye line. Uh, anything else you see there, Dave? Um, you can see kind of from the angle that the the, um, the wrist, you know, the the leading edge leading edge of the wings seem to be kind of even at least with the head a bit. Mm -hmm. Heavy streaking. That streaking looks more like a thick marker than like a a teardrop. So all of those things together, um, and so bird C is a, a sharp shinned hawk. Go ahead and go into D, Dave. Sure. Um, D, if we take a look at D, what do we see here? I'm going to look at overall shape, short wings, short round wings, long tail. So it's an exhibitor, which is what we're talking about today. If I look at the leading edge of these wings and I make a line, the head projects out um, somewhat, but not greatly, right? Um, if I look back at that tail, I see a little bit of a white tip, but it doesn't look incredibly square or rounded, but it does look long and narrow. Mm -hmm. That's a tricky one. The wings are, um, I wouldn't call the wings lanky. I'd love to see the underside of this bird, but they don't always cooperate like that. What else do you see, Jesse? Um, yeah, it's hard to get a feeling for like, the how the wings are held like it looks like the wrists are forward a little bit um is that just a posture thing where this photo was snapped or is that actually how the bird is moving along um the head it's a juvenile again you can you can actually see the light eye we didn't talk about that but older exhibitors have an orangish to red eye so you can actually see it's yellow um you can see that superciliary line again so it's been present in all of these images um but the head doesn't really look, it, it definitely doesn't have a cap, which is a characteristic of that adult Cooper's hawk. Um, some folks like to compare sharp shin hawks to a parakeet. I don't know if I really like that, but it's it's kind of a rounded, rounded head with an eye kind of in the middle there. Uh, maybe a little forward set. It's really a tricky one. 
Yeah, this, this is one where I don't think anyone would be faulted for saying unidentified exhibitor. But, but <laughs> what you took it? this image and you have some other shots of it. What is it, Dave? It is a sharp shinned hawk. Yeah, so a tricky bird here, but but I think a good a good study. A little bit of that that wear and uh, you know the the roundness that this posture makes it look like might make someone think Cooper's hawk. The fact that the head isn't extending out incredibly far, it it you know like I said before, sharp shinned hawks do have heads that that shouldn't um, be that, but but all of these things together, um, sharp is it's a sharp shinned hawk. Right, so that kind of concludes the exhibitors, and we, we don't have much left, um, but we'll go through some, some kite uh, info pretty quick. We're only going to touch on two kite species, and, and that may be, uh, you may be disappointed because there's other kite species in North America, but at our hawk watches, you're generally only very likely to see two species that we'll talk about, the Mississippi kite and the swallowtail kite. Um, and, and in particular, these birds can be seen in, in good numbers at the Corpus Christi Hawk Watch. Go ahead, Dave. You there, Dave? Pointy wings. Oh, long, narrow, pointy wings. Um, great body. Sorry, I had some background noise, so I muted. Um, <laughs> And so the other thing with with um, Mississippi kites is this tail that is very clean edged um, that flares out um, at the tip. So it gets broader at the tip, which um, is a useful trait for distinguishing from, say, a peregrine falcon, which sometimes, you know, can have similar shape characteristics like long pointed wings and a stout body. Um, but the, the Mississippi kite um, tail. Um, if it's not worn, will will um, flare out, and the peregrine falcon tail will actually taper towards the end. So that's something to look for. Uh, primaries on adults are are red, and you can kind of see that in this picture. So these are the flight feathers out at the tips of the wings, reddish, and then the secondaries are kind of a, a lighter white gray, light gray. Really elegant flyer, really smooth in control of itself. Um, Here's the range of Mississippi kites, sort of southeast along the um, the Gulf Coast and up into um, Oklahoma and Nebraska. There's some urban um, breeding birds now, and then they they migrate south. And um, Corpus Christi has counted 52,000 plus Mississippi kites going through um, so far this season. Yeah, and and that may seem like an awe-inspiring number if you haven't seen a movement of of birds or kites in particular before um but here's here's an image from one of our counters tucker davidson took uh, in the last week or two um, of a large number of kites circling about uh, before they kind of kettle up and, and move south um, i i haven't gone through each of these particular individuals to make sure they're all kites but um they they look to be that way and so you can kind of see that flared out tail kind of narrow long wings, um, really a treat to see something like this up in the sky. Here's a closer look. You see that silhouette consistent with, with uh, what was on the first image. And here is a video. It's a pretty buoyant in flight. Um, Really acrobatic, as as a lot of kites are. Um, there's a second bird there. Uh, they will often hunt on the wing. I think it looks like that bird is hunting right there. It looks like it grabs something out of the sky with its foot. Uh, probably a dragonfly. So yeah, really really acrobatic. Um, they can soar. They soar frequently, um, and their wings are either kind of flat or or bowed when when they're soaring. Bowed down. Second video here. Here's a better look at the bird soaring. Long pointed wings. Very sharp angled tail. 
Kind of looks like Peregrine Falcon. But it's not. Now the bird's in a glide here. Kites are elegant flyers. Beautiful birds. Thanks, thanks to Jerry Liguri for the videos. All right, swallowtail kite. Uh, just a really unique, beautiful bird. Um, they've got this fork tail, um, really elegant. Again, uh, we don't see them in large numbers at Corpus Christi, but relative to other hawk watches, we, we most certainly do. Um, 193 swallowtailed kites counted so far this season, Jesse. Nice. So it's, that's a really good number. Um, but yeah, the, the fork tail <clears throat> really sets them apart um, from any other North American raptor species. Um, just really, really unique and, and beautiful. Um, here's the breeding distribution if you want to talk about that, Dave. So they mostly range down into the northern part of, of South America, but they do occur, as you can see here, and breed along the um, the southeastern and Gulf Coast. And there, there you get um, crazy observations of them kind of ranging further up into the northeast every once in a while, too. But down um, southern coast of Georgia, Florida, um, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, and down into Texas is kind of their, their stronghold in, in the U.S., um, and those birds will all move down and out and head down into um, into South America where they winter. And you can see that there's much larger part, portion of the, the entire population of swallowtail kites down in, in South America. Um, but they're just an elegant bird. They're, like Jesse said, they're, they're that striking white on black with that forked tail make them pretty unmistakable. Um, and, and in flight, so long as the tail is not overly damaged and you get the right look, um, and they're, they're elegant flyers, they can turn on a dime. Uh, we don't have video to show in this PowerPoint, but there is video on that Hawkwatch and Cornell Raptor ID app of, of swallowtailed kites. Um, so if you want to see them on video, do that. Better yet, visit um, Corpus Christi Migration Site. Um, next year or, or some time in the future and, and see the real thing migrating um, for real. And people get very excited when they see a swallowtail kite anywhere, but especially at the, at the Hawk Watch, rightfully so. So if you do Absolutely. go there, you see one. Um, cool. Well, I think that's the home stretch for today, right, Jesse? Yep. We um, Thanks for those of you that stuck around. We went a little longer than our, our planned time. Um, but uh, so much to talk about with these cool birds. And like I said, we could probably even keep going, but we're gonna, we're gonna end it today. Um, this was the second of this migration seminar series. So the Exhibitor and Kite ID. On Friday, we'll do um, the Budios. Um, next Tuesday, the Falcons. Uh, next Friday, we'll do that Raptor medley, or as um, Jesse likes to call them, the oddballs, um, the species that we, we haven't covered. And then the following Tuesday, we'll kind of do a wrap up, maybe some Q&A, and we'll, our, we're hoping the technology will let us take a quick sneak peek in um, at the Corpus Christi Hawk Watch and the Grand Canyon Hawk Watch, where we've got crews counting right now. Um, but thank you so much for taking time out of your afternoon. We hope you enjoyed it and learned something, and, and hopefully we'll see you back here again for another session. Thanks a lot.